Thank you, Linda. Now, Ilana Spector Cohen and Lisa Amdur from Tel Aviv University will share with you the background uh, to the creation of the framework and the framework itself. Hi, everybody. Um, we've actually prepared a Prezi presentation, and this is one of... I don't got to... How is that? Is that good? I have to hold it. Okay, is this better? Okay, sorry. Um, we're presenting the um, background to the framework. Um, some of the things that we're going to present, I think they've been presented at the previous conferences. For example, the um, report on the needs analysis that we did. Some of you were here when we did that. So we're just going to run through basically the pr process of preparing this um, wonderful framework. So say, hey, 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 this is, um, it is a combination of three years of very hard work. And again, I reiterate, Linda, without Linda, there would be no framework. That's pretty obvious. Um, so we thought to share with you the process of development and also to look forward to the future. What do we see as the possible benefits of implementing such a framework, as well as the challenges that we may face? Um, so I'll just start here. Hang on, where are my little things? There are little things. Ah, okay, got it. Okay. I'm actually a novice at using this Prezi, so if something goes wrong, you'll know why. Um, so obviously in the center, I just want to go back a little bit because Ilana had this idea. Okay, you have these formats for Prezi. This has got nothing to do with the, found, with the actual document. It's got to do with our presentation. So we looked at all these different, um, what are they called? Templates? Yes, so Ilana said, how about an explosion? So I w she really did. So like, and that can be taken in all very many different ways, both positive and negative, obviously. So this is our like explosion, but it could also be a sun or what, you can take it wherever you like. So we chose this and we, feel we actually zoom in on the um, front cover of this framework, which was also a work of art in terms of the graphics at Uti at night, um, beautifully prepared. Um, so we'll just begin with the process. Where did we actually begin three long years ago? Which seems like yesterday, actually. So the first thing, obviously, is to study the CFR, and we tried to, we read through it more than once and more than twice, to actually really get a deep understanding of what it's all about, in particular the um, action-oriented approach, which I think in, in, in universities today we are probably doing a lot of it, and this is making it more formalized, because I'm sure a lot of us are integrating the four skills, and a lot of us are doing different performance tasks in our, in our courses. This is putting it into a more um, formalized or constructed or structured um, framework. Um, so we try to understand the action-oriented approach and just take into account this was three years ago when we started out and I'm sure all of us have developed since then and things have changed in universities as well as we went along. So that was our starting point. We also needed to understand the terminology because it is a little bit different from what we're used to. So we had to understand what are domains, what do they mean. Obviously educational and professional were pretty clear because they speak for themselves but what is the difference between public and personal. What kind of English do we need in the personal sphere? And also activities, when they divide up into four activities, reception, production, also pretty um, self-explanatory because we do talk about receptive skills and productive skills. However, the whole issue of interaction is also included there. And mediation, which was one that took us a long time to understand, isn't, and it's probably still, okay, Lana says even still. Um, okay, and then when we understood the terminology and the actual um, outline or the maybe theoretical underpinnings of the CFR. Then we moved on to study the can-do statements. We went one by one by one to see what is actually applicable to our context. Okay, so while we, oh sorry, I don't know why he did that. While we were doing that, or maybe simultaneously, now he's not going back. Okay, simultaneously, at night, they carried out a comparison study because you know that the CFR has six levels, from A1 to C2, with scales that are pretty well defined in terms of what a student is supposed to be able to do with the language at each level. And we have in our universities, everybody knows, we have the BCC, Mitkad Mimalef, Mitkad Mimbet, 
and Tom Bissisi obviously as well. And so we wanted to see how are they comparable. What does a mid kadmim bet actually mean in terms of the CFR scales? So um, they conducted a comparison study. I don't know, I don't have the figures how many participated, universities participated. I know that in my classroom, for example, in mid kadmim Aleph, I did give the exam, and they did all the analysis to see what kind of a match is there. Actually, we found a good match that mid kadmim bet is um, B1, B2, B2, sorry, yeah, mid kadmim bet B2, B1 is mid kadmim aleph on certain um, skills. We then moved on to actually select the can-do statements that seem most relevant to our local context. We used expert judgment to do this with, in, um, what is the word now in English? Le gaies? Enlist, recruited, recruited experts to work with us on the can-do statements. We selected some and actually took them as are and included them in the framework, whereas others we kind of adapted in terms of changing maybe what the requirement is for that particular can-do statement. On some others we actually created new ones for our particular needs in Israel. Another thing that we, a can-do statements, everybody's familiar with that, because maybe I'm talking about something that you don't know. A can-do statement simply states what a student can do in the language. For example, a student can interact successfully orally with a um, colleague in the workplace. That would be a professional domain, and that would be a can-do statement, what the student can do with the language. After that, what was really important, even most important, was once you have the can-do statements and you've decided which can-do statements are relevant for each of the levels, how do they progress across the levels? It's very important to ensure coher coherence. Okay, coherence across the levels. Thank you. The next thing we did was a needs analysis. This was particularly important because we thought, okay, so we have the specialists looking at the CFR, seeing what is, in their opinion, most relevant for our needs in tertiary education. What about the students and actual university faculty? So we, um, we designed a needs analysis research. Um, this is something that we have reported at some of the meetings, yes, so I won't repeat it. But the main question that we asked the respondents was, what should a graduate of higher education be able to do in English? Emphasis on what can they do in English? What do they know about English or what, how it is their English level? What can they actually do with the language? What would they like to be able to do? And then we had a whole lot of also statements and they had to say to what extent they agree or disagree with each of the statements. Um, the it was an online survey. It was conducted um, among heads of departments at different universities. Important to note that it was translated into Hebrew and Arabic because we also... Um, ask content lecturers what they think are the needs of their graduates in terms of English. Um, we had 2,395 full responses from students, um, 89 full responses from English language instructors, and content lecturers 175. Um, surprisingly or not surprisingly, the needs, the perception of the needs of the students do not just limit themselves to reading comprehension, which is what we've been teaching over the years. They do want to know how to give presentations. They do want to know how to carry out a conversation. They do want to know how to debate. They do want to know how to write a, a CV. They want to know how to write a, an email. All of these things were really very clear in the needs analysis. So we felt like, okay, so if we're already deciding to adopt the, C, the CFR, what do the students think? The students. I didn't, we didn't ask them, are they for adopting the CFR, obviously, but they are for integrating the four skills and developing their own English um, proficiency um, to a much higher level than what is, is probably expected today. Okay, the next thing we did was, okay, so we've got the can-do statements as are or adapted or the new can-do statements. It was really important for us also to see what do our um, colleagues think of what we've chosen in terms of their importance for what students would need to know when they graduate from university. So we actually asked them, we sent all the can-do statements that we'd chosen and we asked them to rank them in order of importance. We gave each can-do statement and asked to what extent do you think this is important that your graduate should know when he graduates from school. And we also um, analyzed this data and that's how we finalized this actual final copy of the document. Okay, I'll pass it on to Ilana who will talk about the content and also the benefits and challenges. Okay, so if I can ask you please to, t to take the um, 
the booklet out of your bag because I'm going to give you a little walk through. Okay, so just to acquaint you with the contents of the framework, we start obviously with an introduction, and we discuss the Israeli context, the historical relevance of, I don't need it, of the, um, of integrating with the CFR, and the overview of the CFR, including a very short, glossary of terms. This is the tip of the tip of the tip of the iceberg, but these are the ones that you really need to know in order to understand the framework. We then, as Lisa said, present the chosen can-do statements for each of the proficiency levels from Trom CC Aleph, which is more or less A1, to Mit Kadmim Bet, which is B2. And these are presented separately. Following that, you have on sorry, page 39, you have the levels of progression, the progression of the can-do statements across the given proficiency levels with increasing complexity. And you'll notice that in some cases there might not be a can-do statement, for example, for Trump CC Aleph. It's just not relevant yet. And then we have lots of suggestions for further readings. So regarding implementation, we are now in the midst of piloting an online professional development program. It's on Moodle, Learning Management System of Moodle, on the Metal, um, what do you call it, server. And it's designed according to a cascading model, or you could call it a train the trainer model. And what we're going to do once we work through the pilot is we are going to offer this online PDP course. It's moderated. We will be moderating in terms of EchoStar partners. Uh, we'll be offering the course to heads of English departments and or someone who that head might choose. It might be an innovator in the department, someone with background in teacher training and they will be able to take the online course. Once they have finished, they will receive the complete online course, and they can give it in their institutions. They will have uh, administrative rights to edit the course. In other words, they can adapt the course to the specific needs of their institution as well. And then hopefully, that's the, train, the trainer. The trainers will now be um, giving the course to their English staff. There are three modules in the professional development program, or the PDP, as we call it. We'll talk about that in much more detail uh, later on today. But uh, just sort of a global overview, the first part of the uh, PDP gives background on the CFR, and then specifically on our framework. The second module discusses really implementation, how to uh, adapt your teaching to the framework and your instruction and your materials. And then the third um, section or module of the PDP it concerns assessment. Now, it, we, we all know that English departments in different institutions around the country might be at different places. So we might have a department that is teaching reading comprehension only, and that was the original mandate of EAP department. So getting on board um, and taking the professional development program is extremely critical. If we talk about explosions, I sort of see it like it's the opening shot. And then there's a lots of work to do after that, but I think this is you know, the first step that's critical. We also know, as Lisa said, that there are departments who are already teaching an integrated approach, performance-based instruction and assessment. But again, this is a critical step to take the PDP because now we're aligning our instruction with the CFR. So uh, as I said, we're now piloting the uh, PDP at Tel Aviv University and Browda in IDC. And once we 
iron out those wrinkles, we will be offering the course to the heads of departments and we'll be giving information later in the day about how you can sign up if you're interested. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we're going through a quality assessment. Uh, I know, you know, as the head of English programs at Tel Aviv University, I'm doing this and I'm putting this in my quality assessment report. Um, so for some of you, it could be when they ask for future goals, but I'm not waiting for the Malag. A lot of people aren't waiting, waiting for the Malag. We are doing this, we're implementing it now. So put it in, put it in the... I don't know what they'll support or not support. I just know what's going on in the ground. And I would definitely put that in your quality assessment. Absolutely. And I think the more uh, heads of departments who put this goal in the quality assessment report, I think the Malag might be, you know, tend more to be convinced that this is the way to go. You're very welcome. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. So, as they say, the more the merrier, yes. <laughs> yeah, as, as, as Rosalie said, this is a bottom-up initiative, and I think that makes it all the more relevant that we are the professionals in the field and we know where things are going. And this certainly does not contrast with the Balag stated uh, goals of internationalization. Um, this is the way to go. We heard uh, but previously, if you want to inter internationalize, it's English. So absolutely, put it in your reports and get on board with the PDP. So if we're talking about implementation, and looking to the future. What are the benefits of aligning to our framework? First of all, the, the CFR, um, the authors of the CFR, the developers of the CFR say that this is descriptive and not prescriptive. And they very much advocate localizing the can-do statements to the specific context, and we have done that. I think we have also taken into account sort of the historical development of EAP, that we were traditionally, uh, our mandate was to teach reading comprehension only, and we're going through a process, maybe an explosion, maybe a revolution, um, and we've taken that into account, for example, in deciding what benchmarks go, uh, or what can-do statements go in certain levels. We have understood that perhaps in one level, we might have a can-do statement for reading, that's B1, and a can-do statement for speaking, that's A2. So the fact that we have localized the uh, framework takes into account the facts on the ground. Another benefit is standardization across institutions, and if we're going to standardize, then let's standardize according to international standards. So when I, I just want to make one point very clear because I've repeated it over and over and over in various contexts, and that is by standardization, we do not mean uniformity. There is no one size fits all EAP English course. By standardization, we mean that we're adopting common standards for the learning, teaching, assessment of language. We'll have a common language that will lead to mutual recognition. And that's something that has been on the table for many, many years. And we're not saying, for example, that the needs of each institution are exactly the same. So in one institution, you might decide that the exit level for your group is B1. But if that student transfers, for example, to my setting, then I'll know, okay, their exit level was B1, so they have to take the course that's aligned with B2. So this is something that I think very clearly has benefits for all of us. 
And again, we've, when we've been discussing internationalization. So by aligning with the framework, we're promoting both physical and virtual mobility of our students. We heard about Erasmus Plus programs, I would say 10 years ago, Israeli students didn't know what an exchange program was. And today we have more and more and more students who are interested in exchange programs abroad and the host institution demands proof of proficiency of that student, that they are B2, not only in reading comprehension, but in the four skills. It's usually B2, I've seen here and there that they've requested B1, but by far the majority is B2. Internationalizing in, in our various institutions, we have pro, um, uh, complete programs that are taught in English, and we want our local students to be able to join those programs if they want to. We want them to be able perhaps to do their master's degree abroad. We want, if we're offering more and more English medium courses, for example, you might have a policy where the institution says every BA student has to take maybe one or two content courses taught in English. So the advantages of aligning to the framework are quite clear here. Collaboration between universities and colleges. I'm very happy to say that we have set up our HiNet, which is a professional organization of all English teachers in higher education in the colleges and the teachers' colleges in the university. That's already a huge step in the, in the right direction. And the Echo Star Project has been the topic of lots of discussion in meetings. And I think if we all align, there's room for collaboration, for example, in developing materials, in assessment, in research, because we'll have a common language to describe where our students are in terms of language proficiency. And professionalization of the field. Um, I believe that if you're in education, you're always ongoing professional development. And the day that you decide you don't need professional development is the day that you should say goodbye to teaching. So this is another step in professional development, modernizing the field, the, as Lisa talked about, the action-oriented approach, integrating the four skills, uh, global, you know, the global world, 21st century skills, multiple uh, literacy. This is the way I'm convinced that we have to go, and as are our colleagues. But you also have, obviously, challenges. And I think one of the major challenges that we can see reflected in some of the comments that were made is convincing top policymakers. Convincing, for example, the Council for Higher Education, the MALAG. Convincing the top policymakers in your individual institutions. Convincing heads of English programs in your institutions. And also convincing the teachers that this is the way to go. Whenever you have change, you will have some types of resistance. And the way to address the resistance is to give ongoing professional development and support. So as I said, the PDP is sort of the opening shot. But in order to really implement, implement the uh, framework, it's a continual process of support. We also have um, problems with time constraints. Most of the advanced level courses are 52 hours. And we know that to move from level to level in the CFR takes hundreds of hours. So we have to prioritize how we're going to, to devote our class time in this integrated approach. I think part of it will definitely include flipped teaching. So a lot of the frontal uh, types of um, instruction that we're giving during class time can be moved outside the classroom to devote more classroom time to meaningful communicative activities. And then we have lots of gaps that we have to bridge. One, obviously, is across the language skills, the reading, the level of reading comprehension of our students vis-a-vis -vis the other skills. And I have to say, from contact with student populations in other countries, I think the level of reading comprehension is quite high in Israel. But we have to close that gap, and it, that is a process. 
We also have to bridge gaps across student populations, um, Hebrew speakers versus Arabic speakers or other minorities, um, the center of the country versus the periphery, uh, advantage areas and less advantaged areas. So this is something that needs to be addressed not only in terms of English, but in terms of education. Um, from school to university, so again, there is a gap from many students' exit level in high school to the entrance level in higher education. I'm happy to say that we're actually working on this now. Um, where is Siona? Siona's over here. Yes, we have a new chief inspector for English for the Ministry of Education. We'll be talking later in the panel. And we are actually looking at this continuum of uh, from school to higher education. We're comparing the curriculum for English for the Ministry of Education with the, the can-do statements in the CFR. So I think it is a very exciting time. As uh, we've heard throughout the day, we've had our ups and our downs, our crises and our celebrations. And uh, I think this is absolutely the way that we have to go. There's absolutely no question about it. Um, and I really invite you to to join us in this journey or this celebration. Um, and we'll be talking uh, later on today about the actual professional development program. So thank you very much.